question comes from the dad of a young lady that you've been tutoring, and he would like to know why the standard math curriculum is failing uh, over 90% of our students. Well, Debbie, that's a really good question, and as you can see, I've put together a PowerPoint presentation to really answer that, because we do get asked that all the time. And of course, uh, as you know, I believe that our U.S. mathematics education system is failing. And when I say that, I think it's failing our students, but it's also failing our teachers, and then as a matter of fact, it's failing our entire society because mathematics is so critical, really, to our future. Now, the question is why is it failing and how is it failing? Those are two main questions, but the most important question is, is what can we do about it? And I plan to answer all three of these questions, particularly this latter one, what we can do about it, because I believe it's imperative that we do something and we're now in a position where we can. As to why it is failing, uh, the really facts of the matter are the math education system that we have today has been evolving really for the last 2,500 years because it really started with Euclid's elements uh, over 2,000 years ago. But then as it's gone on through the years, through the 1700s and the 1800s and the 1900s, it's just picked up an awful lot of stuff. A lot of the things that we teach today uh, are things that were developed uh, two or three hundred years ago. And it's not that they're not true, but they're not necessarily appropriate for today. So what you might say in effect, in effect is that our current standard math curriculum uh, has just evolved and is not really the product of what I would call intelligent design, if you'll pardon kind of a, a metaphor there. Um, and today we're in a position where it could be. So the question then is, what can we do about it? Now the obvious answer, I believe, is that we've got to create a new math education system. And to do that, we're going to apply 21st century technology and also knowledge that we now have. And Really, things have changed a great deal, really, in just the last few years that enable us to do things that we should do and that we can do. Now, to fully understand what I'm going to talk about, we need to understand the concept of STEM, S-T-E-M, and that is an acronym that stands for Science and Technology and Engineering and Mathematics. And Mathematics, of course, is really the foundation and the basis of all of STEM subjects, whether it's chemistry or physics, or economics, or mechanics, or whatever it might be. Now, mathematics, as a matter of fact, Debbie, as you know, consists first of all of concepts. And we'll talk about the concepts in a moment that are important today. Uh, we use these concepts for mathematics to set up models for things that are in the real world, problems that we want to solve. And then it also consists of tools and algorithms. Algorithms are simply rules for doing things. And tools are the things, uh, the tools that we use to do the calculations. And these tools and algorithms are what we use to solve these problems we set up for these math models. Now, the real problem you're going to find out today is that we're using obsolete tools and obsolete algorithms. That's the biggest problem we have with our um, math curriculum today. Because once you take the concepts and apply them and use the tools and the algorithms to solve the problems, then you've got solutions, and those are solutions then to the real world problems, whether it's science, or engineering, or any other technical subject. Now, as I said, why has it failed? How, how has it failed? Well, today, our standard curriculum focuses way too much time on obsolete tools, and for that matter, on concepts that are no longer relevant like they once were, and not nearly enough time on modern concepts and modern tools that we should be using. So that's really how it's failed. And this is a, is a huge thing. Uh, and in fact, unless you really understand math, you're not going to understand uh, why that is. So what I'm going to be describing for you here is, is, is those very issues. First of all, the concepts of mathematics. Well, the first thing we need to understand is numbers. And we'll talk about that in a little more depth in a moment. Then we need to understand some geometry. Because geometry and numbers together is what you use to build these math models, particularly for engineering and science and practical math. And then there's something that you can't solve with ordinary just numbers and geometries alone using uh, triangles, and you need something called trigonometry. Now, these three subjects, Debbie, are what you need for what I call practical math. 
everyday mess, setting up and solving everyday problems. And of course, as you know, that's what we cover in what we call the practical math foundation, the first two tiers. Now, if you're going to go on in STEM and study science and engineering, then you need a something called functions. Functions are the basic building block of all these models for all these STEM subjects. And if you're going to study functions, then you need the tools to do it. And the tools that you need for that are what are called calculus and differential equations. These are the tools that all modern scientists and engineers use to study functions. And functions are the basic building blocks of all of these models. So first, let's just talk a little bit about numbers. Because right away, this is where our standard curriculum gets all found up. We have the natural numbers or the counting numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And that's where we begin, and we teach our kids that. And that's proper. And, and we start teaching our children that at a very early age. And we teach them the decimal number system because that's a wonderful invention for dealing with numbers. In fact, if you don't think the decimal number system is a wonderful system, just try to do arithmetic with Roman numerals, for example. Now, we expand the natural numbers to include negative numbers and zero. And once again, we do this at a pretty early age. Uh, because it's fairly easy for students to understand it. You just think of climbing a ladder as the natural numbers, and then if you're going down into the ground, that's the negative numbers. And then, of course, pretty early on, we teach them about fractions, and those are called rational numbers. Now, Debbie, these are the numbers that you need for STEM subjects. You need rational numbers and integers of natural numbers. Now, as a matter of fact, back in the 1800s, when uh, mathematicians were making math rigorous, they, just, they, they found out that there's more than just the rational numbers in a theoretical sense. And they call, and expanded that to something called the real numbers. Now, that's a theoretical concept. And as a matter of fact, uh, this now includes what are called irrational numbers. But uh, that's not something that you need for STEM. And it's not something we should be teaching our kids. We really need to focus on these first three number systems. Once we've done that, and we're ready now to teach them STEM and go on into more advanced, you need complex numbers. Now, if you don't know what those are, don't worry about it. Let me just tell you that, that if you think of the rational numbers being one-dimensional, like on a number line, the complex numbers are two-dimensional. They fill up the plane. And this is very, very important for science and engineering. And this needs to be taught at the high school level. Now, something is very interesting. There was a concept called infinitesimals that our ancestors used for thousands of years to do calculus and to understand it. But back in the 1800s, mathematicians couldn't figure out how to make them rigorous, so they banned them from math. And even to this day now, they're not in our math education. In the 1960s, they figured out how to put it back into math. And so now that they should be back in it, but they're not, because this is the way you really understand calculus at a very, very uh, heuristic and intuitive level. And uh, we're not doing that today, and we should. Now, geometry is the other thing, numbers and geometry. You've got points, which are zero-dimensional. You've got lines, which are like one-dimensional. They're straight lines, but you also have curved lines. You have polygons and circles, which is two-dimensional. Uh, the most important polygon, by the way, is triangles, and that's where you uh, use trigonometry. These, again, are two-dimensional, and you're interested in uh, all things about a triangle. Then you go to three-dimensional objects, cones and cylinders and spheres and balls, and now you're interested in things like volume and surface area. So these are the concepts of geometry. And we, by the way, we teach most of this now at, at a very uh, heuristic level in practical math. But then, of course, we're going to get into it much deeper when we get into uh, calculus and functions. Now, numbers and geometry alone are not enough to solve problems. You need some tools to do it. And the tools we develop are generally called algebra. And you need it to solve certain problems in geometry. One of the things you probably have heard of is something called the Pythagorean theorem. And you need algebra to go along with the geometry to solve certain problems. This involves triangles. The most important concept in geometry, by the way, for practical math is similar triangles. And there you bring algebra into play. Uh, then you talk about uh, analytical geometry, putting algebra and geometry together. Uh, you have certain equations for straight lines, conic sections. Algebra is used in trigonometry. It's used in complex numbers. And of course, it's used in calculus. So algebra is a very large subject, and it's a set of tools. Now, we teach the basic algebra you need in practical math in only 10 lessons uh, in the beginning. But then later on, if you're going into STEM, you need a lot more. Now, Debbie, as I mentioned earlier, if you're going to study STEM, go beyond practical math. 
then the thing you've got to understand are functions. This is the most basic concept that's used in uh, science and technology. And you have all kinds of functions. You start off with the most simple are called polynomial functions. You take quotients of polynomial functions, you get what are called the rational functions. These are pretty easy to deal with algebraically. Then you get the trigonometric functions. Now, these are very, very interesting. Uh, these are called the circular functions, and they're very, very important in modern uh, science. In fact, you can't do modern science without the trig functions. You also have something called exponential functions, and those are also equally important in modern STEM math. So these are things you learn now, and uh, you begin to learn about them in pre-calculus, getting ready to use them in, in, uh, for STEM. Now you can put all these together and compose them and make composite functions. And you get some very, very complicated functions now uh, when you start putting these together. You can also take something called inverse functions. You have the inverse trig functions. Uh, the inverse of the exponential is the logarithm function. And so when you put all these together now, you've got a whole catalog of functions you use. These are called the sort of the standard uh, functions. And then you can do things to them. Uh, you, can you can take derivatives of them. And you can take antiderivatives of them, and this is what you do in calculus. So these functions now are going to be the things you have to understand for STEM. So for example, if you take a function, Debbie, what are the things you need to know about it? And this is where calculus now begins to come to play. The first thing is you have to graph the function. And that used to be very difficult to do when you had nothing more than a pencil and paper to work with. Very, very hard to graph functions. But when computers came along and graphing calculators, it became much easier. But graphing them is, a, is like a picture of the function, and you can understand it so much better if you can see a picture of it. You need to know where it crosses the x-axis, what are its so-called roots. You need to know if it has what are called asymptotic behavior. We'll talk about that later. These are all three things, Debbie, that are covered usually in pre-calculus and algebra. Then you want to ask things about your functions. Are they increasing or decreasing? You want to know do they have maximum, do they have minimum points? You want to know about concavity, concave up, concave down points of inflection or the concavity changes. And finally, can you take a function and represent it as an infinite series or approximate it as a Now, Debbie, these four things, four through eight, are what are called differential calculus. And usually this is taught in about a one semester course, and you learn to uh, deal with certain functions um, using calculus and answer these questions. But that's not enough. You're also going to know what's the area underneath the graph of a function, or what's the length of the graph of a function. Or if you rotate it around an x-axis, what is volume? And this is what is called integral calculus, these sections 9, 10, and 11. And I will tell you, Debbie, this is much, much harder than differential calculus. Uh, as a matter of fact, integral calculus is what has flunked more kids out of engineering school than anything else. It's usually taught in the second semester of calculus. It's a bunch of ad hoc integration techniques, and it's very difficult. Traditionally, it's been very difficult. And then finally, if a kid gets through calculus successfully, then they get introduced to what are called differential equations. And this is the workhorse of modern STEM mathematics. And if you think calculus was difficult, the differential equations is even more difficult because it's a bunch of ad hoc techniques. Now, I'm talking historically. All of this has changed today, as you're going to learn as we go on in this. And in fact, what we can do today is just absolutely mind-boggling. And in the second half of this uh, presentation, I'm going to explain that to you. OK. Now, Debbie, back to why we're failing. Um, we are teaching today a bunch of obsolete tools and algorithms, which are rules of doing things. And the math we're teaching today is kind of like we're teaching carpentry using hand tools. It's like we're teaching things that were developed in the 17th and the 18th and the 19th centuries that were very, very good then. They're very, very powerful when that's all you had to work with, but they're not power tools. And today, we got power tools, and that's what we should be teaching. Because these old hand tools are obsolete now. Nobody will, will do, use them anymore. Nobody's going to pay you to use them, and that's what we're teaching today. The other thing we're doing, Debbie, is we're teaching premature theory. Now, I don't know how this all came about. This came about really uh, sometime in the 20th century. All these hand tools, by the way, were all developed in the 18th and 19th centuries. But the, the, the theory uh, really was developed by mathematicians in the, in the 1800s, the 19th century, and got put into our math curriculum somewhere in the 20th century. 
And we start teaching them a lot of rigorous proofs and stuff, and it's just premature. We need heuristic proofs, intuitive proofs, but not rigorous proofs. And we teach theoretical concepts that aren't relevant. I'll show you a couple examples in a moment. And these uh, theory concepts are not necessary for science and engineering. They're only interesting uh, to theoretical mathematicians. Let me give you an example. You probably heard of irrational numbers because they're included now today in all the uh, algebra books. Well, an irrational number is a theoretical concept. It's not something that any uh, scientist or engineer ever needs to know about. I mean, for example, I saw this in a freshman uh, algebra book. Is the square root of 12.1 rational or is it irrational? Now, the facts of the matter are it's irrelevant. Uh, it turns out 12.1, uh, 12, uh, 12 that square root is irrational. If you take 1.21, that square root is rational. But it doesn't matter. No scientist or engineer needs to know that, and we shouldn't be teaching that sort of thing to our, our beginning students. In calculus, back in the uh, 1800s, uh, they used infinitesimals, and they get wonderful uh, explanations of calculus concepts using infinitesimals. But when they made it rigorous in the 1800s, they couldn't figure out how to use infinitesimals, so they banned them. And they started doing something called epsilon delta limit proofs, and that's what's in all our calculus books today. Well, in the 1960s, they managed to make infinitesimals rigorous again. So, but did they go back now and change the calculus books and put them back in the way they should have? No. Math educators don't like to change things. They like to leave things alone. And so today we are now teaching theory that came out of the 1800s. It's very difficult. It doesn't help you understand anything. And we haven't reinduced the things, introduced the things now that we could be using, infinitesimal. Of course, as you know, I do it in my calculus when I teach calculus. But this is what we're doing in our standard calculus course. So uh, that's an example of premature theory. Now, the more important thing, is the obsolete tools and algorithms. I'm going to give you some examples. There are lots and lots of examples. I'm going to give you some real simple examples. Here's something that we have our kids do with pencil and paper. We'll give them, this is a, called a quadratic polynomial equation. x squared plus 3x minus 4 equals 0. If you ever took algebra, you probably can remember seeing something like this. And the question now is, find the values of x for which this will be true. That's called its roots. So what value of x will this be a true equation? Well, one way to do it is to factor it if you can. So for example, this factors into x plus 4 times x minus 1 equals 0. And that means then that x minus 1 has to be 0, which means x has to be 1. And x plus 4 has to be 0, which means x is minus 4. So the two roots now are 1 and minus 4. So one way to find the roots is to factor it. So you say, well, that's a good thing to teach them because you teach them how to find roots. Well, not really. Here's why. Take this very same polynomial. Instead of a 3 here, put a 2. x squared plus 2x minus 4. What are its roots? Guess what? You can't factor it. It won't work. So this thing we're teaching them to do doesn't work most of the time. As a matter of fact, if this is not a 3 or a minus 3 right up here, in other words, if we, if we take the same equation, x squared, and make this b now an arbitrary number, x minus 4, unless b is 0 or minus 3 or plus 3, this can't be factored. You can't solve it this way. So factoring almost never works. And yet, if, so if you're going to do this problem, you can't use factoring. Well, we're teaching them an obsolete tool. Now, I'll carry that a step further. Something you all, we ought to teach our kids is the distributive law. a times b plus c is equal to AB plus AC. This is called expanding or simplifying. Turn this around. AB plus AC is equal to A times B plus C. This is called factor. Okay. Certainly we don't teach our kids this. We teach them this at a very early age. I teach them this in pre-algebra, uh, in the foundations course, actually. They should learn this probably in, you know, the fifth grade or something. Fourth or fifth grade. It's elementary. Well, take this uh, polynomial equation, 3x minus 2. Uh, times 2x plus 5. We can multiply that out using the distributive law. This would be 3x times 2x plus 5 minus 2 times 2x plus 5. And then we apply the distributive law again. And we get this numbers. Then we combine these two terms and we end up with this. 6x squared plus 11x minus 10. Now Debbie, this is easy for a student to do. 
multiplying this out. But then here's what we do, Debbie, and this is what we shouldn't be doing, but this is what we do do. We take this polynomial, 6x squared plus 11x minus 10, and we give it to them. You know, you see where it came from. We give it to them. We say, hey, we want you to find the roots. So that means you factor it. Now we teach them that the way you factor it is you've got to have a number times x and another number times uh, x over here, these two factors, and these have to multiply to be 6. We put a number here and a number here, and those have to multiply to be minus 10. And we start trying, we just trial and error. 6x minus 1 times x plus 10, we multiply it out the way I showed you up above, and when you get done, oh, this is a 59 there. You're always going to have 6x squared and minus 10, because you're rigging it up to do that. This will be 59. Well, that won't work. So we come back and try something else. Well, let's take 6x plus 10 and x minus 1. Well, multiply that out, that's a plus 4. Well, that didn't work. Try 6x minus 2, x plus 5. Multiply that all out. And remember, you're always going to get 6x squared and minus 10, but when you do the distributive law and combine terms, this is a 28. That doesn't work. Try 6x plus 5 and x minus 2. Minus, that doesn't work. You say, my goodness, is it going to work? Well, we know. We rigged it up. It's going to work. Uh, minus 1 and plus 10, that doesn't work. Plus 10 and a minus 1. And 3x minus 1, 2x plus 10, it doesn't work, doesn't work. Finally, we get down 3x minus 2 times 2x plus 5. Oh, and it finally works. This is the 11. Uh, here's the point, Debbie. We give a problem like this to our kids that we've rigged up. And we make them go through and we make them do all this until they find the answer. Now, you might say, well, they need to learn to do that because that's how you find roots. Well, Wrong. Change this from 11 to an 8. Guess what? You can try everything to factor it and never will it work. As a matter of fact, uh, it won't work 99.9% .9 of the time. Factoring just is not the way to find roots. But we, we have our kids practice on this, and we practice and practice, and we test them on it, and, and we act like it's important to them. When in point of fact, they're never going to use it. Now, you might very well say, well, what are they going to use? Well, question is, then, what would work on this? Or take x squared plus 2x minus 4. Factoring won't work on that. What are you going to do? Well, take an arbitrary quadratic, ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0, where a, b, and c are arbitrary numbers. And how are we going to find the root? Well, there is a way to do it, Debbie. And in fact, we teach our kids this. It's called completing the square. And it's, it's, a, it's a fairly long process. And when you get done, you end up with the two roots. And here's this famous quadratic formula. I won't go over it. If you remember it from high school, fine and dandy. I will tell you that when I was first taught this, when I was in the ninth grade, I, it really confused me. I had no idea where it came from because my teacher, I don't think, understood completing the square algorithm. He just gave us the formula. He said, this will always work. Now you can factor this polynomial. It'll be a times x minus root 1 times x minus root 2. So it'll always work. But the question is, uh, and if you're going to do it manually, this is the way to do it. Forget the factoring part the way we did earlier. You've got to use this. But guess what? Today, I can take this thing, and I've got a tool. It's called Wolfram Alpha. Now I introduced this in tier 4. 6x squared plus 8x minus 10, and that translates Wolfram Alpha into a Mathematica um, command, solve 6x squared plus 8x minus 10, and in bingo, it gives me the roots. And by the way, these roots now, are this is applied to quadratic formula, and this does it automatically. So the point I'm getting at, Debbie, is we have a tool today to do this. We don't need to teach our kids how to do this manually. We just give them this tool, and they're going to do it, because this is how any scientist or engineer will do it. Now, I might point out, you might look here and say, well, wait a minute. I, I want the answer just as a number that I can uh, measure. Well, you come over here to where it says approximate forms, and you click on that. And when you do that, it'll change it, and it'll put the, root, it'll put the roots in this form. Same problem, only now it gives you the roots, minus 2.1196 and 0.7863. This tool does this for you. Now, you're going to have people going to argue with me and say, well, they need to learn the manual way because maybe they don't have access to this tool. My answer to that is, that's like telling somebody who's got to drill a bunch of holes, don't use a power drill. Uh, the manual way is like an old brace and bit. 
Yes, it works. It's a lot of work. It takes a lot of effort to learn it and master it. It takes a lot of effort to apply it. And no one's going to pay you to do that today. This is You're going to use this tool. Now, I'll grant you this is a modern tool. This is a 21st century tool. This Wolfram Alpha was introduced in 2009. It is on the Internet, and it is free. It's the way we ought to be teaching our kids to do things today. Now, let me point out, this was what's called a quadratic. This is a power 2, x squared. What if you had a power 3? Let's take 6x cubed plus 8x minus 10. Well, there's an algorithm for doing it, Debbie, and here is the answer if you apply the algorithm. I let Wolfram Alpha do it, of course. Look at that, Debbie. Cube roots, square roots. Can you imagine what you would have had to go through to apply this algorithm to do this? Well, I'll tell you right now, this is not included in hardly any algebra book because it's too complicated. So we don't teach things that are too complicated. Uh, we want to see the approximate form of it. Here it is in the approximate form. Wolfram Alpha gives it to us immediately. So they take something that could be done historically, but it was so difficult we didn't even bother teaching it, and it does it automatically, instantly. Here's a fourth degree. Now there's four roots, and Wolfram Alpha gives them to us immediately. Here's a ninth degree. Wolfram Alpha gives us all nine roots, just automatically. Wolfram Alpha is just this fantastic tool today that we need to be using to have our kids learn to do uh, various types of algebra. In fact, it even plots these. These are complex roots and even shows them to us in a complex diagram. Now if you don't understand what I'm saying, that's okay. What I want you to get out of this is that we should be using the tools now. This is what we should be teaching. And this, Debbie, is just the tip of the iceberg. Wolfram Alpha is this fantastic 21st century tool, and it's going to tell you everything you want to know about any function. Everything. Remember what I said you need to know. If you've got a function, you need to know how to graph it. You need to know its roots, its asymptotes, increasing or decreasing, max minimum, concavity, points of inflection, series representation, area beneath the graph, arc length, volume of solid revolution. You need to know all of this. And then this is what we teach kids in calculus. They do, do it manually. We teach them manual ways of doing all this. Wolfram Alpha does it automatically. These manual algorithms that we're teaching our kids today in our algebra, in high school, in our pre-calculus, and even in our calculus today using pencil and paper is like, Debbie, it's like walking or maybe running on foot. Debbie, much of our current math curriculum still consists of this. This is how we still do it. It's like teaching people how to do things by walking or running. Now, many years ago, over 100 years ago, they came up with some tools that they used that made this somewhat easier than running. Uh, they had logarithms and trigonometry tables. They had a tool called a slide rule. And this is what I now call horse and buggy technology. This was developed back in the late 1800s and, and was used in the 1800s and in the, in the, in the 1900s. I'm sorry, the 1900s and then in the, in, in the uh, 2000, the 20th century. As a matter of fact, when I was a young man, these are the tools I was taught. These were the most advanced tools of the day. In fact, I taught these tools when I taught engineers. Uh, back in uh, engineering school, back in the 1960s. And uh, they were great tools, by the way. Compared to paper and pencil, these are fantastic tools. It's like comparing a horse and buggy to running. Let me tell you, if you've got your choice between walking or running, a horse and buggy is a whole lot better. Well, guess what? In 1972, Debbie, the world's first handheld scientific calculator was introduced, called the HP-35. It cost $395 in 1972. I remember it vividly when it came out. That was very expensive. In today's dollars, that's over $2,000. So it was a lot of money. But it was like automobile technology. And immediately, the slide rule, the log tables, and the trig tables we were teaching, the horse and buggy technology was obsolete. Overnight, in 1972. Obsolete. And this is what we need to be teaching our kids today to start with, horse and buggy technology. Now you might say, oh, well, wait a minute, that's expensive. Well, guess what? As you know with computers, everything is improved. This today is the calculator I teach them to use. It's a TI-30XA. It's much, much more powerful than this one, much better, much easier to use. 
The batteries in this only lasted three hours. The batteries in this last three years. It, uh, it's much easier to use. It's a great calculator. And guess what? It costs less than $10 today. You can go to Amazon or Walmart or any store that sells calculators and buy this thing for less than $10. This is what I call automobile technology. This is what we need to be teaching our kids to begin to do calculations. And that's what I do in practical math. As a matter of fact, using this calculator, as you know, because we're doing it, we can teach a student all of the algebra and all of the geometry and all the trigonometry they need to solve any practical math problem in about one semester, about 50 or 60 hours of their time. That's all it takes. It's self-paced. It's interactive. It's delivered over the Internet. It's, it's extremely uh, valuable. All of the algebra, geometry, and trigonometry that used to take a whole high school career to learn, you can learn now one semester. And when you get done, you're ready for a, what I call a non-professional technical career. You're ready for the military. You're ready for industry. You're ready for an apprentice program. And as a matter of fact, you'll know more mathematics than 95% of the adults in the United States today. All in 50 or 60 hours, Debbie, in one semester. Because of this power tool, I call it the automobile this scientific calculator. If it wasn't for that, you'd, it'd still take years to learn all this. If you had to still use slide rules and log tables and pencil and paper, it'd still take you three or four years to learn all that. You could do it in one semester. Now, Debbie, today I mentioned earlier briefly Wolfram Alpha. This is jet airplane technology. Back in 1988, a wonderful, wonderful tool called Mathematical was introduced. It's expensive. Scientists and engineers started using it back then. It took powerful computers. It was very expensive. I don't blame uh, anybody for not trying to introduce it into, to our children because it was, it was very expensive. But Wolfram Alpha is based on it, and today it's free, and it's on the Internet. It's 2009 when this was introduced. And this is like jet airplane technology. Uh, you can today, uh, you take the math curriculum that's taught today, it's still based on the old technologies. They spend about 5% of their time teaching concepts. A lot of them are obsolete, but, that's, but they still only spend 5% of their time because they're using obsolete tools and they're spending 95% of their time teaching these obsolete tools to do the calculations. That's what we're doing today in high school. You know, why is it obsolete or how is it obsolete? We spend a small amount of time teaching concepts, a lot of time teaching obsolete tools. If you will you introduce Wolfram Alpha and do a pro and the scientific calculator, you can spend 95% of your time teaching the concepts. By the way, the concepts are not very difficult. The real problem is calculations. And then you can spend 5% of your time teaching these modern tools. They're so easy to use. And they also, thanks to Wolfram Alpha, give you an unlimited ability to solve problems. The modern math curriculum, Debbie, is 100 times better it's almost infinitely better than the standard curriculum. It is so much better, it's hard to even comprehend it. Now, if people want to know more information about this, as you know, they can go to uh, our website, triadmathinc.com. That's our company where we're dedicated to introducing the new curriculum, a version of it now to anybody that wants to learn math the modern way. My personal website is craighain.com. A lot of the same material is there. And you can go there to get a lot more information. Uh, what I'd like to do now, for those of you that are not interested in STEM, you're just interested only in getting your children started in math, maybe they don't like math, they're afraid of it, and you want to go back and you want to teach them math using the modern curriculum with the TI-30XA calculator and put them through the 50-hour uh, course, uh, that I told you about here where they can learn everything in 50 hours, uh, this webinar for you is essentially over. Uh, you just go to our website, uh, learn more about it. I've got lots and lots of videos there that talk all about this stuff in great detail. You can buy our program. It's relatively inexpensive. It's, it's guaranteed to work, and you're ready to go. Now what I want to do, I want to extend this webinar for those of you that are interested in STEM because this is where things get just absolutely unbelievable. STEM math education in the 21st century. 
Now, there's nothing like this out there today that I'm aware of. This is going to blow your mind what you're going to learn now in the next uh, probably 20 or 30 minutes. Okay, I'm going to assume that we've taught your student how to use the calculator and we've taught them all of the practical math they need, algebra and geometry and trigonometry that they need for the military or industry for non-professional. It's taken them 50 or 60 hours, like one semester to go through it. And I've put students of all ages through this, and I've taken students that really hated math, were afraid of math, I'm talking adults now, have bad experiences with it, and they go through this, and they're just amazed at how easy it is and how wonderful it is. It transform it's life transforming, frankly. Now let's suppose that you've got a student, they've gone through this, and they think, you know, I might be interested in STEM, you know, I kind of like this math stuff, maybe I could do science and engineering. Um, but what do I got to do to do it? How am I going to pursue a STEM career? Well, let me tell you this, mathematics is the foundation of all STEM. And so here's what we will do. You're going to go teach your student now some algebra and geometry and trigonometry at a deeper level. And once you've done that, you're going to teach them calculus and differential equations, all in high school. Now, here's what you're going to do to do it. You're going to teach them Wolfram Alpha. This is the modern jet airplane technology. It's only been available since 2009, but it's available available today. It revolutionizes how STEM professionals, I'm talking scientists and engineers, are doing their math. They just don't do anything as taught today. Nobody is going to do calculus and, and, and differential equations the way they're taught in the standard curriculum today because of this tool. You just wouldn't do it, and, and I'm going to demonstrate that to you now. First of all, remember that the most important concept in STEM math is the idea of a function. Functions are the building blocks of all the models. And that's what the students got to master, the concept of a function. And then to do the things you need to do, you've got to know calculus and differential equations. And of course, there's the old manual way that's taught today, or there's the modern uh, professional way using uh, Wolfram Alpha. And so this is what a STEM pro has to know. Remember what they have to know about a function. You're going to see this several times. Graphing, roots, asymptotes, all of these. These are the things they've got to know. And I'm going to show you now how Wolfram Alpha does all this. The first thing you have is the graphing. <clears throat> now, historically, we taught students to graph manually. Uh, but then finally, in the late 18, uh, 1980s, graphing calculators came out, and we began to be able to show them how to do it with a calculator. And that was good. Um, in the old days, it was very difficult to, to graph functions. Uh, but then it became easier with the graphing calculators. But I'm going to show you how we do it today with Wolfram Alpha. Here is a fifth degree polynomial, and we're going to look how you would graph it. Now, polynomial functions are the simplest functions that there are, the easiest to use. So Wolfram Alpha, you say plot, you put in the polynomial function, here's the command it gives it, and here's the graph. Wolfram Alpha did this. So here's a fifth degree polynomial, and here is its graph. Now. Graphing calculators will do this too. Uh, they're obsolete now because of Wolfram Alpha, but they'll, they'll do it. Uh, here's what the graph looks like. I blew it up a little bit for you. And you can really, this picture tells you how it behaves. Uh, as x gets negative, uh, it goes to minus infinity. If x gets positive, it goes to plus infinity. It's got a maximum, it's got a minimum, another maximum, another minimum. It's concave uh, up some places, concave down others. There are deflection points. And it crosses the x-axis, it looks like, five times. Well, what are the roots? Where does it cross the x-axis? What are they? What's the maximum and the minimum points? What are the inflection points? Now, you can actually approximate that just from the graph. You, if, you, if you blow this graph up and look at it closely, you can get approximate answers to it that way. But you need to know more accurately a lot of times, and that's what we teach in calculus. So the first thing is the roots. Well, I will tell you, historically, finding the roots to this polynomial was impossible with manual techniques, because it's a fifth degree polynomial. Well, would they, they wouldn't have tried to teach you to do it. Now, this You will never find this in any algebra book, high school algebra book today, or calculus book either. Here are the roots. Wolfram Alpha did this for us. There's the roots. Remember? They were up here. There it is there. As a matter of fact, uh, if you look at the root plot, there they are. It, it points out, and you can see exactly what their values are. Wolfram Alpha did that automatically, just immediately. What about maximum and minimum? What about points of inflection? What about the concavity, increasing and decreasing? These are all questions that calculus did historically. And it was all manual. It was very, very 
arduous to do this, but it was doable. Now, Wolfram Alpha will tell you immediately the maximum and the minimum points. As a matter of fact, it will give them to you on a graph. There they are. And you want to know those values. What's that value right there? Well, what's the x value and what's the y value? Well, let's go back and look at it. The x value there was 2.8, and the y value was minus 70. And it did that for all. It did that for all of the uh, maximum and minimum points. And you can see where it's increasing: increasing here, decreasing here, increasing, decreasing, increasing. Now, all that would have taken a student if they could have even done it. By the way, they wouldn't have done. This is too hard for a standard calculus course. You couldn't even have done this with standard calculus. And I won't get into the reasons why, but that would have been very difficult. But uh, but if you could have done it, uh, this is the answers you would have gotten. Uh, here's the inflection points, and uh, it'll show you right there. They are. There's the there's the three inflection points, and there's their values. Here's the x value and the y value for the three inflection points. Now again, this was a hard problem in calculus. You would spend a lot of time trying to do this problem in calculus if you could have done it at all. It would have been very difficult. Wolfram Alpha does it automatically. So that's how we deal with uh, the roots and the. That's how we deal with the graph, the roots, increasing, decreasing, maximum, minimum, and concavity and points of inflection. All of that is done. These seven things were done with Wolfram Alpha. There weren't any asymptotes to deal with. Well, then you want to know about the area under the graph. Well, I just took the first two roots and I took its area. And I said, what's the area between the first two roots? Wolfram Alpha told me. Now, this is what's called an integration problem. This wouldn't be too hard to do using the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is something a student could do if they knew what the roots were. They could go from here to here, and this would be the answer. But, of course, Wolfram Alpha just gives it to us automatically. The arc length is another matter. If I want to know the arc length of this function, in other words, I want to know what is the length of this right here. From here to here, what's the length? Well, it's not too hard to put together the arc length formula. This is the derivative of the function squared plus 1, take the square root, and integrate it. What would be hard to do is to integrate it, and Wolfram Alpha does it automatically. Now, if you know calculus, you, you just begin to stagger at how powerful this is. If you don't know calculus, then just take my word for it. Figuring this out in here is not very difficult for a student, but actually evaluating the integral is almost impossible, and Wolfram Alpha just does it. And there's the arc length. What about asymptotes? Well, here's a typical rational function, and you want to know its asymptotes. I put it, I asked Wolfram Alpha, and it told me. It's got vertical asymptotes at these two points, and it's got what's called a par parabolic asymptote as x goes to infinity there, and in fact, it'll graph it for us, and here it is. The solid line is the graph of the rational function. The dotted lines are the asymptotes, vertical asymptotes and a parabolic asymptote in this example. Now, Wolfram, now, this is a problem that we would give the students in a calculus course. They'd have to figure out the roots. They'd have to graph it. They'd have to figure out the vertical asymptotes by finding the roots of this denominator. They'd have to figure out the uh, nonlinear uh, asymptotes as it goes to infinity. This is a doable problem using algebra. Very difficult, very time-consuming, but doable. Wolfram Alpha did it automatically. Now, let me show you something. Here is a function defined implicitly. And I want to know its asymptotic behavior. By the way, this is something engineers and scientists have to do. This is STEM math. Well, this is very hard to do manually. In fact, you won't find this problem in a calculus book, I don't believe, because it would be just virtually impossible to do it manually. Watch this. Wolfram Alpha did it for us. Here's the graph of the function. Actually, it's, it's, it's multi, because it's implicitly defined, it actually defined multiple functions. And here are the asymptotes of those functions. So as x gets large, you've either got a parabolic asymptote or you've got a, a horizontal asymptote. And ditto here. And ditto back over here. Now, Wolfram Alpha does this automatically. I can't tell you how incredible this is. Uh, this is not a problem you would even give in a calculus book today. So if an engineer had this problem, he'd be stuck. He wouldn't know what to do. There's no way to do this with standard calculus the way it's taught. But with this tool, you do it. It's just amazing. Remember, these are the things you need to know. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to kind of conclude this by going through all of these things with a special function that isn't really very complicated, but it would be virtually impossible to do this with the standard classical calculus techniques. Here's the function we're going to take. We're going to take the sine 
of x squared. This is a simple composite function. This is a function that comes up in engineering, and we need to know how to deal with it. So the first thing we want to know is how do we graph it. Now, that would not be, a graphic calculator probably could do it. It certainly would not be able to do manually, easy to do manually, but here's what Wolfram Alpha does for you. It plots it, bingo, there it is. That's the graph of the function, sine of the quantity x squared, this composite function. Very important function in engineering, by the way. Now the question is, what are its roots? What are its maximum minimum? What are its points of inflection? What are arc lengths? What's the area under it? And so on. And so watch how this works out now. First, I want to know the roots. So I say solve this thing equal to zero I'm from minus five to five. So here's the Wolfram Alpha command, and here's the answer. Bingo. There's the roots. You want to see them graphically? There they are graphically. So they match up with the uh, graph. So you see the roots, and if you want to know what they are exactly, there they are. Now I'm going to tell you something. Doing this manually, the old-fashioned way, would just have been very difficult. It's doable. This particular one was doable. I know how to do this manually, but it's not easy. How about maximum minimum? That's much harder. And here they are. At x equal the square root of pi over 2, there's the maximum. So now it's showing you the maximum and the minimum, and there they all are. And by the way, you'll notice that the maximum are all up to number 1 and the minimum are all at minus 1, because remember, this is a sine function. But the hard part is knowing where they occur. It's knowing the x values of it. And there they all are, and it's showing you the x values for them. Now, that wouldn't have been too terribly difficult. It would, would have been for him a difficult problem, but Wolfram Alpha just did it. Inflection points. There's the inflection points. And there they are on the graph. Now, what else do we want to know? Well, we want to know what happens is when you have a function, this happens all the time, Debbie, in engineering. You've got a function, and it is so complicated, you need an polynomial approximation of it. That's called a series approximation. So I tell Wolfram Alpha, I want a polynomial of order 15 that will approximate this function. And here it is. It's called a Taylor series expansion. Now, Debbie, I don't know. I can do this manually. I can teach a student to do it. I'm going to say it's going to take me an hour to do this manually. And that's assuming I don't make a mistake. And then I've got to check my work. This is a very, uh, it's not a conceptually difficult problem, but very time consuming. Wolfram Alpha just gives it to you immediately. Now here's a very hard one. What if you want to integrate it, which is to find the area in it from minus 5 to 5? Well, it turns out you can't do this using ordinary integration techniques because the integral is what's called a special function. This happens to be what is called a Fresnel integral. And this is important in science. You won't even see this in a calculus book. What if you want to know the area between that function and zero? Well, you take the absolute value of it, and here's the answer to that. Very, again, very difficult. What about the arc length of it? Even a, an even more difficult problem. And there's the arc length. There, there's, the, there's what it is. And by the way, this is a very difficult problem to integrate. So I've just pointed out to you how powerful Wolfram Alpha is. Let's say you rotate it uh, from zero to three about the uh, x-axis. You want to know the volume of that. You ask for the volume of the solar revolution. Well, here's the formula for it. That's easy to figure out. The hard part's integrating it. it. It's a different Fresnel integral. There's the answer to it. There's what it looks like. Wolfram Alpha graphs it for you. You want to know a surface area? Wolfram Alpha will tell you that. There's a surface area. So it's going to do all these things. Now, what happens? Uh, so the bottom line of it is, and I've just demonstrated very quickly with a couple of examples, Wolfram Alpha does everything, 1 through 12. It does it automatically instantly, and uh, it's just amazing. And that's what we need to be teaching our kids today. Uh, as a matter of fact now, as you know, our calculus course can teach a kid everything he needs to know, I say a, a student of any age, really, a boy or girl, everything they need to know about calculus to go into engineering or science in one semester. It is so, so easy to use this tool. But of course, it's a lot easier to fly from here to New York in a jet airplane than it is in an automobile and a whole lot easier than it is in a horse and buggy. What we're teaching today in our current standard math curriculum is essentially horse and buggy technology. Maybe in some cases a little bit of uh, early automobiles. 
We need to be teaching them jet plane technology. Now, after calculus comes differential equations, and that's even harder than calculus traditionally. Differential equations, Debbie, are the workhorse for STEM. And guess what? Due to Wolfram Alpha, they're just as easy as calculus. We should be doing them now in high school. If I'm going to send a child of mine off to MIT or any good STEM school, I'm going to teach them calculus and differential equations using Wolfram Alpha. They're ready now to take any kind of engineering course they're going to get into because they can do the math. And this needs to be done in high school. And now one last thing you say, well, gee, that's a lot more than being done in high school with it. Yes, it is. It needs to be done. We need to do this in high school. Well, is that all? Are we done then? And the answer, believe it or not, is no. Because in 2014, something called Wolfram language was introduced. Now, I've been talking to you about Wolfram Alpha, which is based on Mathematica. Wolfram Alpha came out in 2009. Wolfram language, by the way, with Wolfram Alpha, you enter one instruction at a time, and that's all you can do. With Wolfram language, you can write programs using natural language and Wolfram Alpha. It's a natural language programming language. It's the greatest programming language ever developed. It is so much easier than any other programming language. You could do fantastic things with it. Students can begin to learn this at an early age, really. You don't even really need to know calculus to begin to learn this, do this. Although if you know calculus and differential equations, it just makes it that much more powerful. Now, Wolfram Language came out in 2014, and I thought, oh my goodness, it's going to be like Mathematic. It's going to be too expensive. You won't be able to do it. Guess what? There's a computer today called the Raspberry Pi, and the Raspberry Pi only costs $35, a powerful computer, and it comes bundled with Mathematica and Wolfram Language. In fact, it's the first computer that's been bundled with Mathematica since 1988 when it was bundled with the Steve Jobs' next computer. $35, Debbie. $35. Now, you got to add a keyboard and a monitor. But for $35, you've got this powerful thing to teach kids natural language programming and, and Mathematica. And once they've learned Wolfram Alpha, which we teach them in the calculus and the differential equations course, it's easy to step up to Mathematica, particularly with the natural language, Wolfram out. This is phenomenal. And this is what we need to be teaching our kids. Now, I haven't got a program on this yet, as you know. We're just working on differential equations now. We finished calculus. This is 2015, right at the end of it, when this is being made. Uh, but we're going to work on this next year. In 2016, not only are we going to come out with differential equations, we're going to come out with a Wolfram language program. And let me tell you, if your child today learns differential equations and calculus and how to use Wolfram Alpha and learns how to do these things and then learns differential equations and then learns Wolfram language, oh, they're going to be almost infinitely better prepared than students coming out of our current standard curriculum. It's just phenomenal. And this is what, this message we've got to get out today. This is the message that math educators need to hear. This is the message that math teachers need to know. It's certainly a message that parents and students need to know. Now, how long will it be before our math educators and our system catches up with all this? I don't know, Debbie. As you know at Triad Math, we're doing it, and uh, you can go and keep up, monitor our progress with us there. If you want to start a child or get a group of children involved in this, then uh, you contact us and we'll do that. It's all available online. It's interactive. It's not very expensive. Uh, by the way, we don't use any textbooks for this. Well, that's not true. We use George Simmons' textbook, which is a $15 book in uh, pre-calculus. But for calculus and differential equations, there are no textbooks today that we use for this. Um, this is all done uh, using uh, the, the modern technologies that we have, our own custom notes, and teaching the kids how to do it. So, Debbie, does that answer your question? I think so. That's just amazing, and it does make you wonder why our educators aren't making these changes now, but I'm so glad that you are. So, 
I guess we'll move on to our next question then. Okay. Thanks, Deb.